Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Kirk Campbell for a talk on updates on focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Dr. Campbell is an assistant professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. He received his medical degree from the University of Connecticut and completed a residency in internal medicine at Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. He then completed a clinical and research fellowship in nephrology at Mount Sinai. Dr. Campbell spent two years on the faculty at the University of Miami before returning to Mount Zion to lead an NIH sponsored research group focused on understanding the mechanism or focus ideas for the progression of proteinary kidney disease. He is the director of the Nephrology Fellowship Program at Mount Sinai and is a member of the Medical Advisory Board of the National Kidney Foundation of Greater New York. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kirk Campbell. Thanks, Peter, for the nice introduction. So, here to talk about FSGS, one of my least favorite topics in medical school, I have to say, but yet here we are. Um, a lot has changed over the years, and hopefully, you know, you'll come to uh, the same appreciation that we've gained in nephrology over the last uh, decade or so. Um, FSGS really is a part of a spectrum of proteinuric uh, kidney disorders uh, that includes um, diabetic disease, uh, even sometimes hypertensive disease, aging. Uh, and these are actually a significant uh, a burden in the U.S. healthcare system, estimated to cost about $20 billion per year uh, in uh, annual expenditure. And uh, proteinuric kidney disorders are a major cause of uh, mortality in the U.S. So it's estimated from the CDC's 2012 data that uh, nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, and nephrosis uh, taken together as uh, diagnostic codes really accounted for uh, the number eight cause of uh, uh, mortality uh, in this country. And we can certainly appreciate that uh, patients with proteinuria do worse. They have a, a higher uh, levels of mortality, uh, cardiovascular morbidity. And uh, this, this is actually data from the Valsartan uh, heart failure study, where it showed that, as you can see in the, in the blue and um, red uh, bars here, uh, patients with proteinuria, regardless of whether or not they had chronic kidney disease, actually did worse than patients uh, without proteinuria. So, Proteinuria in and of itself is bad, but it is a marker, right, uh, of disease. Um, it's a bit controversial whether or not simply having protein in the urine uh, increases uh, injury that, that patients uh, have in their kidneys, but certainly having protein in the urine is a bad prognostic sign and it's highly associated with increased uh, mortality. Uh, so what is FSGS? Well, it's really not a disease, right? It's a histologic pattern of injury, uh, and this was the um, point of the having disease in, in, in quotes, um, it's really something that you see histologically under the microscope. And uh, it's called focal segmental glomerular sclerosis because it's focal in the sense that only less than 50% of the glomeruli uh, are affected. And it's segmental because of the ones that are affected, only a part of them are affected as well. And this is compared to a diffuse or a global uh, uh, disease uh, uh, pattern. So, as you know, in the uh, glomerulus, uh, blood enters uh, through the afferent arterial, passing through the renal corpuscle and returning to the circulation by the efferent arterial. Uh, the primary filtrate, which is urine, passes into the proximal tubule, and this is how urine is eventually produced. Uh, however, in FSGS, you get a scar developing in a part of the glomerular tuft, and this, over time, can impair uh, filtration. You have a re reduction in your uh, glomerular filtration rate. So this is what it looks like histologically. You know, again, um, you can see that uh, two of these glomeruli are affected uh, on this low power image. Uh, you can see a scar segmentally here. This one is a little bit more uh, encompassing of the tuft, whereas this glomerulus looks pretty normal. Um, on a high power view, again, you see a scar taking over a big part of the glomerular tuft with a part of it, again, appearing uh, normal. And we know now that the target cell of, of injury is the, the podocyte that's overlying uh, the, the um, epithelial space, the urinary space uh, within the glomerular tuft. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, because it's actually impossible to discuss FSGS and Portner without talking about injury to, to these uh, uh, cells. So looking at a scanning EM view, uh, these cells have a very large uh, cell body uh, with interdigitating foot processes that sort of wrap around uh, the glomerular capillary loop. And normally, this is on electron microscopy, how a uh, transmission EM view of the filtration barrier would look. You have the podocyte foot processes sitting on the basement membrane, uh, and then you have endothelial uh, uh, cells with fenestrae, uh, allowing blood to, again, um, uh, pass through uh, the GBM, which with filtrate um, on the other side, the urinary space, uh, that, that are lined by the podocyte. 
when you have proteinuria, uh, you get effacement of these podocytes. So you now have actually uh, more protein uh, passing through uh, this uh, filtration barrier uh, with podocyte food process effacement. And Portner has been recognized uh, for certainly a very long time, and, and Hippocrates in his writings uh, commented that when bubbles settle on the surface of the urine, it indicates diseases of the kidneys uh, and that the complaint will be protracted. So this was really a sign that uh, uh, proteinuria uh, is a marker of chronic kidney disease, and this was recognized, again, uh, a very long time ago. Um, and of course, back in those days, uh, patients uh, would urinate in, into uh, called a, a matula, um, and the technique of uroscopy would be used to identify bubbles or discoloration in the urine to identify chronic kidney disease. And, and you can find you know, a, a lot of um, images uh, uh, throughout history, 11th century, 17th century, of uh, the urine being examined, um, and sort of analogous to what we use as a, with, with the dipstick, there was a uroscopy wheel, right, where you could compare uh, the color, right? Uh, you could detect hematuria, right? You could, you could, uh, you know, detect um, this correlation with bilirubin being in the urine. Um, if, if there was a lot of foam, that would indicate uh, a significant amount of protein in the urine. And we still ask patients when they're treating them for nephrotic disorders, you know, if they see a lot of foam in the urine, is there, are there a lot of bubbles in the urine? And they'll say, no, it's getting a little bit better. And that'll tell us that maybe there's less protein, but of course we have to verify that. So we've come a long way, uh, needless to say. Um, but uh, you know, certainly the nephrotic syndrome was also recognized uh, uh, historically by the Greeks and the Arabs. And um, in 1827, Richard Bright documented the association between uh, edema, uh, albuminuria, and uh, kidney disease. And you know, I, I just love the term dropsy. I see this in Downton Abbey, which I used to watch uh, when they discussed patients having dropsy, and I said, "Wow, that's uh, that's that's real interesting." <laughs> so. It was not until the 1914s, early 20th century, that we started to distinguish uh, nephrotic versus nephritic disorders. And a lot of this work was done in, in Germany um, and really um, continued uh, to um, advance. And we, we did have some uh, part in history at Mount Sinai in 1970 when Dr. Churg characterized a group of patients with focal and segmental uh, disease uh, in a Lancet article uh, that was uh, highly cited. So just talking about the classification and pathogenesis uh, of the disease, um, it is a part of the nephrotic syndrome. And in its most uh, severe clinical presentation, it would be characterized by the classic features of nephrotic syndrome, uh, which would be nephrotic range proteinuria, uh, low serum albumin, uh, hyperlipidemia, and uh, edema. And uh, usually when patients present with this florid clinical presentation, uh, we would think that they likely have a primary uh, FSGS if that's what they actually have. Um, and, and of course, a lot of other things can cause the nephrotic syndrome. So we have to do a kidney biopsy or additional workup to identify the underlying cause. And there can be secondary diseases um, like diabetes, um, uh, some infections. Um, there are classic primary disorders, though, minimal change disease, FSGS, and membranous nephropathy. In, in adults that we, we classically associate with the nephrotic syndrome. But again, uh, as you can appreciate, we need to do a biopsy and an additional workup to identify FSGS as a distinct entity uh, from the other causes of nephrotic syndrome. And there are some familiar faces uh, in, in, pub, in, in the public domain who have had FSGS. Um, I don't know how many basketball fans are, are here. I mean, I'm personally a Nick fan, although it's hard to do that recently. But, um, <laughs> Alonzo Morning and Sean Elliott both had FSGS, and they actually both had uh, kidney transplants uh, and, and returned to play. Um, the etiology uh, can be wide and varied, right? Uh, there, there are idiopathic causes, but we do know that hyperfiltration uh, causing stretch on podocytes uh, uh, can cause this. Viral infections like HIV can be associated with uh, this histologic pattern. Um, some hereditary lesions, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, are also associated. And uh, medications as well. So, you know, as we're taking a history and, and working patients up, we certainly look for uh, potential contributing causes uh, before we decide on treatment, because that would be important. I mean, if you can identify an underlying etiology, you would direct your therapy towards that as opposed to uh, treating for an idiopathic disease. Uh, so, how do you get from podocyte injury uh, to the scar developing? Well, uh, one model that was developed um, by Wilhelm Kritz uh, suggested that um, uh, 
Uh, again, um, in the glomerular tuft, you have uh, urine normally coming into the afferent arterial and then passing into the proximal tubules, primary filtrate. But when you have portocyte injury, uh, these cells are lost, and there is this um, uh, model that holds that you have misdirected filtration um, causing an initial scar within the glomerular tuft, which can then spread to involve uh, the rest of the tuft. So you don't really have the scar jumping from one glomerulus to another. Sort of within that individual glomerulus, you have a propagation of the scar over time to reduce the ability to filter urine. And uh, this was illustrated uh, very nicely uh, by Roger Wiggins' group uh, in, in Michigan, where uh, they could um, progressively rid the glomerulus of podocytes selectively. So this uh, brown staining um, is a podocyte marker called uh, GLEP1. And what this group did is that they expressed this diphtheria toxin receptor on the podocytes. So by giving uh, the rat the diphtheria toxin, you could deplete podocytes without doing anything else at all to the animal. So the, the percentages here refer to the percent number of podocytes um, uh, that are depleted. So starting at baseline, you have all your podocytes intact. When you give the toxin and the numbers um, of, of podocyte depletion starts to increase, you start to see as you're losing podocytes with decreased brown staining, you're starting to see a scar develop. And the more brown staining you lose, the more scar you have. So as you're losing podocytes, you have the scar getting bigger and bigger and encompassing more of the glomerulus to the point where when you no longer have podocytes that are readily detectable, you have this big scar taking over the entire glomerulus. Uh, so this really showed us quite clearly in a very nice model that by doing nothing else but taking podocytes away, you can get FSGS initially and then global sclerosis later. So we now believe that, that there is a, a progression, if you will, of podocyte depletion. And these cells are terminally differentiated, right? Um, you do not regenerate them. Well, not, not significantly. There, there's some discussion about that recently. But um, you lose them over time throughout your life. So if you suffer an insult, uh, an acute illness for some sort, you may have some loss of podocytes, but if it's less than 20%, you may get better, right? You may have a little bit of proteinuria. We see this all the time in patients in the critical care unit, for example. They, they, they may become septic and they have a little bit of proteinuria, um, but then it, it sort of gets better. Um, if you have a progressive disease where you lose more than 40% of your cells, that's when you get a high level of sustained uh, proteinuria, decreased renal function, progression of disease. So we do have this 40% threshold, and the 20 to 40% range is sort of intermediate. So that's how we think about uh, the depletion of these cells. And this sort of holds true for, for a number of uh, different proteinuric uh, models. So what's the epidemiology of uh, focal sclerosis? Well, it's been increasing in incidence, and we don't really know why. Um, so the data from uh, the US uh, Renal uh, Data Service uh, shows that um, since 1980, among all ethnic groups, uh, the, the incidence of FSGS has been increasing significantly. And this is compared to, to other glomerular diseases. Um, th there have been a lot of theories uh, posed for this. I mean, some may say it's because of the diet. It's just really not clear uh, what, what, what's, what's happened. Um, but this has been replicated by a number of smaller series from different parts of the country as well. So we really believe that there's more FSGS being seen now uh, than we did uh, decades ago. So it's a point now that FSGS is the most common primary glomerular disease underlying ESRD uh, in the US. And we wonder what the prognosis is. Well, it sort of depends on a number of factors, right? Um, uh, you know, beyond factors like ethnicity, uh, which can play a major role, uh, the amount of proteinuria that the patient has uh, will determine the, the prognosis. So patients uh, who are non-nephrotic, so patients with, say, you know, less than a gram or even one to two grams of proteinuria, they tend to do better than patients who are nephrotic or have, say, more than 14 grams of protein in the urine. So we definitely pay attention to how much protein patients have uh, when we're deciding uh, on therapy. And we, in fact, will use immunosuppressive agents, um, more um, aggressive measures when patients have more than three grams of proteinuria. The renal function um, at presentation also matters. And um, you know, th th there has been some evidence that when patients have an elevated creatinine as well, they tend to do worse. And the histologic subtype also matters. So the scar that develops in the glomerulus can actually happen at a number of different points in the tuft. Uh, we won't go into this in too much detail, but the most aggressive form is when the tuft is collapsed. Um, and that uh, uh, subtype uh, tends to have the worst prognosis and it's the one actually associated with HIV, 
um, uh, but it can also occur uh, in non-HIV non patients. Uh, when the scar is closer to the proximal tubule, we call this a tip lesion, and that carries one of the better prognoses. Those patients tend to respond a little bit better uh, to steroids, for example. Um, kidney transplant is, is the preferred therapy, and I, I'm not just saying that because Dr. Murphy is sitting in the front, but it really is uh, the, the, the preferred uh, uh, therapy for a wide variety of uh, kidney disorders. Uh, but there's a little bit of a problem with FSGS uh, and kidney transplantation. Uh, the disease tends to come back um, more than the other uh, glomerular disorders after transplant. Uh, and this was um, recognized um, back in, in the 1970s where um, a number of different groups are reported on steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome coming back uh, after a kidney transplant. And um, the Lancet um, had a, an article as well in 1972 um, that described the potential for there being a circulating factor in patients uh, that could increase uh, glomerular permeability to protein. So this is one of the first um, uh, you know, articles that, that commented on the potential for, for this um, uh, uh, secreted factor uh, that could pr promote proteinuria. And the fact is about 30 to 40 percent of patients uh, who've had a kidney transplant for FSGS do have a recurrence of the disease uh, and that number tends to go up if you retransplant those patients. Uh, Virginia Savin, in, in a New England Journal article in 2006, um, did some elegant studies uh, that, that kind of solidified uh, our view that there is, in fact, a circulating factor. Um, she studied 100 patients with FSGS, uh, a number of whom underwent uh, transplant, uh, and 33 of them had uh, recurrences. And she was able to take plasma uh, from those patients and inject them into, into rats, um, and the rats actually developed proteinuria. Um, when those patients had plasmapheresis and the, the plasma was then given to the rats, you didn't get proteinuria um, or um, a permeability to albumin in those animals. So the, 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 the factor has not been characterized, but it's quite clear that patients who have recurrence of disease in their plasma, they do have high levels of a circulating factor uh, that can uh, predispose to increase proteinuria. Um, there's a, a very nice um, article in the New England Journal in 2012 um, where, where something quite interesting was done. Again, it's a nice uh, physiology lesson and, and you know, shows what can happen um, when we follow the literature and, and think clearly about what we're doing when patients present. So this is a case of a 27-year-old uh, man with end-stage renal disease from FSGS. Um, and uh, he received a kidney transplant from his sister. Um, now, because of the potential risk of recurrence, uh, even though he was getting the transplant from a relative and so on, um, plasmapheresis was done uh, two sessions pre-op and five post-op. This was really as a precaution. Not a lot of centers would have done uh, pre-op pheresis, but it was done in this case just uh, to use all aggressive measures to prevent the disease from coming back. The graft did function immediately, uh, which was very nice. However, on the second post-op day, the patient had 10 grams of proteinuria. Um, the, and, and a biopsy uh, uh, confirmed uh, early lesions of FSGS, so it's more full process effacement on, on EM uh, with, in, in a patchy formation uh, that was consistent more so with, with FSGS. The light microscopy didn't yet have significant scarring, which is very important. Um, so the graft was removed um, on post-op day 14 because the patient was doing so poorly. They took the kidney out, right? The patient got the transplant, but he was doing so poorly. Um, a lot of proteinuria, albumin was falling, creatinine was rising, he had an intra-abdominal hematoma, just doing very badly. So the, the physicians thought about this and they realized that this patient likely had a circulating factor that was causing uh, the transplanted kidney uh, to uh, develop proteinuria, cause proteinuria. So the, the patient um, agreed to donate the, that kidney to someone else who likely would not have the factor as secreted. So how did they identify that other patient? It was a patient with ESRD from diabetes, uh, so a totally different cause. It was clear this patient did not have FSGS. And interestingly, when this new patient, the second patient, uh, got the kidney, it again worked uh, beautifully. The creatinine went down, proteinuria went down. They, they, they did serial biopsies that showed a reversal of all the lesions. And eight months later, the patient had a normal GFR and very little proteinuria. So you can just sort of see the trend uh, here in patient one. Um, the, 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 the red line is the proteinuria, and you can see that the first patient had significant proteinuria, his GFR was going down. When they took that same kidney and put it into the diabetic patient, uh, the proteinuria went down, 
and the GFR went up. So it all depends on the host, right? I mean, some patients do have the susceptibility um, to developing FSGS, and it, even if you give them a perfectly good kidney, which th this kidney was great, it's just not, not a right fit for them. So we still don't know what the FSGS factor is, what its composition is, its origin and target cell, um, how we could inhibit it. And there have been a number of studies that have um, proposed uh, a few circulating factors, but some have been more controversial than others. But the bottom line is right now we just don't really know. And it's, it's a little bit scary uh, for us um, practicing clinically, but at least we understand um, you know, that there are certain patients that we need to be, to be more uh, aggressive with and we're uh, about transplanting. So the genetics have actually taken a central role, uh, as it has throughout uh, medicine. And uh, in the last uh, several years, there have been a number uh, of um, disease-causing gene mutations identified in FSGS. Um, the first one was nephrin, and then that was followed by podosin, um, PLC epsilon 1, alpha actinin 4, and uh, some of them have been in autosomal dominant inheritance patterns, most of the ones that affect adults, and a lot of the um, pediatric uh, ones have been autosomal recessive. Um, and, you know, if you identify a patient less than one year old with FSGS, um, if, you, if you do a mutation screen, you're, you're quite likely to find a disease-causing variant. It's a little bit harder in the adult population, so we don't tend to do um, routine genetic screening in our adult patients. Uh, but for pediatrics, uh, it, it is done uh, more commonly. And this has actually enabled us to understand a lot more about the molecular architecture of the podocyte cell body, the slit diaphragm, and the, and the GBM. And the, all these molecules we've identified have really d largely um, resulted from the renaissance that's, that, that, that happened with the positional cloning of the, these disease-causing variants. Uh, and it's led to a uh, big explosion in a uh, um, potential targeted therapy, which we'll sort of touch on uh, towards the end of the talk. So th it, it does matter, actually, if you identify a disease-causing variant in patients. It can also matter for prognosis and response to treatment. Um, we do know that patients who have non-genetic uh, uh, FSGS uh, tend to respond more to medications like cyclosporine uh, than patients who have genetic causes. So uh, the, the response to therapy seems to be uh, worse if you have a genetic cause. And it does seem also that you are more likely to progress uh, towards ESRD. So when patients have these disease-causing mutations, the clinical course is more aggressive, they don't respond as well to treatment, and they progress faster uh, towards end-stage renal disease. But the disease doesn't really come back when you transplant them. And, and uh, that, that also would be a bit intuitive, right? Um, uh, if, if it's not a circulating factor causing the disease, but a, a disease-causing mutation, if you give that patient a pretty good kidney, they tend to do better. And this was uh, one small series where they screened for uh, a, a, a NPHS2 uh, mutation, podosin mutations, and patients who had um, homozygous or, or compound heterozygous mutations in podosin uh, uh, did not have a recurrence of FSGS after transplantation. So I think going forward, we're going to really try to stratify patients based on the etiology of disease rather than using a, a one-size-fit-all uh, approach, which is, has been the practice for, for decades. Um, one item that's been getting a lot of attention in the news has been this association uh, of APOL1 um, gene mutations with uh, kidney disease. Um, so uh, APOL1 um, is, is a, a protein uh, that um, can actually be active against trypanosomes, which cause African sleeping sickness. So the trypanosomes, is, this is sort of a, a, a cause a, a fly-borne parasitic infection, um, sort of due to the, the tsetse fly um, causing the parasites uh, to um, uh, attack uh, patients' um, red blood cells and so on. It's, it's sort of a, a pretty aggressive uh, clinical course in many cases. Um, but <laughs> APOL1 um, can actually cause lysis uh, of the trypanosome in culture. And what we found is that patients with G1 or G2 uh, variants of APOL1, uh, they can actually uh, promote lysis of the trypanosome in culture. Um, however, having these increase significantly the risk of non-diabetic kidney disease. So you have resistance to one disease, but increases your risk for another. Um, kind of, uh, you know, a, a lot um, uh, th that we've seen in, in other diseases. Um, the APOL1, the way it works is that it can cause lysosomal swelling, which causes the parasite to die. But over time, uh, the parasite uh, developed this virulence factor uh, 
that made it resistant to APOL1. So in response, uh, humans have developed uh, these gene variants that can then bypass this virulence factor to, to eventually cause uh, uh, lysosomal swelling and, and uh, lysis of the parasite. Uh, so this has sort of been an arms race um, toward evolution uh, that, again, can cause uh, increased susceptibility to, to one disease. So sort of putting some of this uh, together, um, there are immunologic, genetic, and um, other host factors uh, that can cause uh, podocyte injury, and this can be manifest uh, as FSGS. Um, we tend to use, for therapy, a lot of um, uh, repurposed drugs. Uh, believe it or not, there, there are no um, specific uh, uh, drugs for FSGS approved by the FDA. So we've been using medications uh, that could potentially uh, decrease the activity of the circulating factor, medications like prednisone, uh, MMF, cyclophosphamide, calcium inhibitors. Um, others may stabilize the actin cytoskeleton, um, and we certainly use uh, antihypertensive drugs, ACE inhibitors, uh, as first-line therapy. But I think ultimately we'd like to get uh, towards uh, targeted therapy uh, for, for this disease. And we do know, for example, that uh, steroids um, can stabilize the, the cytoskeleton of the podocytes, right? Um, in culture, this is what podocytes normally look like with a nice intact actin cytoskeleton. But when you injure them uh, with uh, pure mycin aminonucleoside, you lose that. Well, if you, pre you pretreat with steroids, though, you have more stability. So a lot of these agents that we've been using for other etiologies uh, may have uh, direct action uh, on these cells. So in, in, in our work, I'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing We've been focused um, on uh, uh, sort of characterizing novel mediators of, of podocyte injury that could lead to a focal sclerosis. And we've also been trying to identify uh, potential therapeutic targets that could slow disease progression. And looking at some of the novel mediators, one, one pathway we've been interested in is the hypposignaling pathway, which um, has been the subject of a lot of attention recently uh, in the oncology literature. So um, downstream in the hippo pathway, this molecule called the YES-associated protein. Um, it's a transcription factor that works to promote cell survival and differentiation. It's a very potent oncogene and a, an attractive target for chemotherapeutic drug development. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So it's really pro-survival in a lot of other model systems. Um, dramatically, in the liver, um, if you um, overexpress uh, this gene, uh, in hepatocytes, you get uh, significant hepatomegaly uh, at one or even four weeks. Um, if you uh, expose these animals to increase the uh, uh, YAP expression even longer, you actually get the features of hepatocellular carcinoma. And there have been a lot of uh, solid malignancies uh, where YAP has been activated. So as I mentioned, it, it really is a, a very attractive target uh, for inhibition in a variety of, uh, of cancers. Some of that work is, uh, is being done here. Um, we looked um, for YAP expression in podocytes, and again, knowing that it's the target cell for injury, um, we just showed that YAP was expressed, both in the nucleus and the cytoplasm, and it's also in, in podocytes in uh, mouse sections. Um, and we'd also shown that if you silence uh, uh, YAP, you get increased uh, susceptibility uh, to injury uh, in, in these cells. So this really set the stage for us to look at more of an in vivo uh, phenotype and also to assess its expression in, in human disease. And um, there's some nice work uh, done by uh, Nikki Schwartzman, who's actually an intern now um, uh, here in the residency program. She did this during a scholarly year as a med student uh, here at Sinai, and Jenny Wang, uh, my, my postdoc, where we actually silenced YAP uh, in vivo in, an animal, in, in animals um, and showed that it causes uh, classic features of FSGS. So it's a very nice model uh, that, that we'll just briefly touch on. So this was YAP expression at baseline, and when it was gone, it's no longer there. Um, and um, over time, the animals developed significant protein in the urine. Um, they had a, a corrugated uh, capsule uh, of the, the kidney. The creatinine went up, and, and you can see the albumin creatinine ratios also increased. Um, we could also see a reduction in the podocytes down to that 20 to 30 uh, percent threshold level. Um, pretty dramatically, um, compared to wild type animals that had pretty normal looking glomeruli. You can see this is classic FSGS, right? Uh, two of these glomeruli had a segmental scar, uh, whereas one appeared normal. And on a higher power of view, you see, again, the segmental scar with uh, a part of the tuft uh, appearing relatively normal. And when we aged these animals over time, you got global sclerosis, tubulin interstitial dilatation with uh, tubular casts, um, and uh, progressive 
um, ESRD, and eventually death. Um, so, uh, you know, this was a, a pretty dramatic uh, phenotype, to be honest, one that we weren't initially expecting. Um, uh, a lot of times in, in, in these models, you have to impose a second hit, uh, but this in and of itself was sufficient to cause a, a disease. Uh, and it, it provided actually some caution uh, to, to folks uh, developing YAP inhibitors uh, because they could potentially be nephrotoxic uh, by causing portocyte injury. And we've seen this, we've seen this in, 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 in the clinical uh, realm, right, where VEGF inhibitors uh, used to, to treat ovarian cancer, for example, can be associated with uh, significant proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome. Um, uh, uh, using um, you know, immunostaining, immunofluorescent staining, we could also show that YAP staining was reduced uh, in, in the glomeruli of patients uh, with FSGS, but you know, they also had less podocytes, so um, we still have more work to do to show that this could be uh, causative. Um, how about potential therapeutic targets? Well, we're working on that a little bit as well. Um, and, and, you know, one um, molecule we've been studying in our group uh, since the time I was a fellow here uh, was, was dendrin, uh, which is expressed highly in podocytes and also at the slit diaphragm. And, you know, we're able to, to show that, that dendrin shuttles between the cytoplasm and the nucleus in various cells. But um, more dramatically, when we could silence dendrin, it had the opposite effect of, of yeah, it was protective. So the loss of this protein is protective in cells. Um, and the striking thing is that the, the animal, the dendrin knockout animal, is totally normal. So based on our findings, uh, we, we hypothesized that um, the loss of this uh, protein could be protective. Uh, and so we did uh, a few studies um, to, to test this hypothesis. Um, First, we, we took um, this uh, adriamycin nephropathy model, which is really doxorubicin that you can administer. And animals, the wild type animals, get significant sclerosis, again, tubular injury, a lot of proteinuria. But when you delete dendrin, uh, these animals look pretty normal, really not much protein. So uh, dendrin deletion, again, uh, could be protective uh, in this animal model. So we sort of expanded this um, into um, this uh, CD2AP uh, uh, knockout study, which was uh, just published. Uh, and again, Jenny Wong, Kristen Meliambro, who was a fellow here and you know, junior faculty member in, in my group, uh, was very, um, did some very nice work in, in carrying this work forward. Um, sort of getting to the point, essentially, we used a, a model of FSGS, which is a CD2AP knockout model. And these animals get significant glomerular sclerosis. But if you don't have dendrin around in those animals, they're protected. Um, and they look a lot more like the wild type animals. So again, deleting this, this uh, protein uh, was very protective. Um, and it also uh, improved the lifespan of the animals. It protected them from uh, increased creatinines and also reduced the amount of protein in their urine. Um, and this is actually pretty dramatic. Uh, there, there haven't been models like this described where you could take something away uh, and, and you could slow disease progression. Of course, deleting a gene is not a strategy to treat a patient. Uh, but if we could um, somehow inhibit the function uh, of this molecule, uh, we think it could be a good uh, therapeutic target. So how about existing targets? Um, well, there, there have been a few that have been explored, and these are some of the ongoing uh, clinical trials that we, we hope uh, will offer more targeted therapy uh, beyond uh, our use of our repurposed uh, uh, agents. Um, endothelin receptor antagonists have been uh, in, in clinical trials a uh, recently concluded study that we participated in um, explored the use of a TGF-beta inhibitor um, because TGF-beta expression has been increased uh, in these uh, disease models. Um, uh, P38 MAP kinase has been implicated, uh, and uh, B71 has also uh, been mentioned. Um, this was actually a New England Journal paper that, that we contributed to uh, my, my research mentor, uh, Peter Mundell, who used to be on faculty here. Um, and what they did was um, they took patients uh, with uh, FSGS, both um, primary idiopathic and post-transplant. And they, they showed that um, patients who have increased expression of this B71 molecule may respond uh, to a B71 inhibitor, a Bodicept. Um, now, there have been some technical concerns with the, the, the reproducibility of the stainings. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do in a lot of different groups. Uh, but the idea here was to enable us to uh, use a, a marker uh, of potential therapeutic response uh, in, in patients to predict who would potentially benefit from selective agents. And, and this has been used in oncology and many other fields, and, and hopefully we'll get there. And, you know, whether it's B71 or something else, 
uh, I think this really has to be the approach, using targeted therapy based on histologic markers or biomarkers or, or whatever else. So just to tie everything uh, uh, up, um, FSGS really is a, a unifying uh, pathological finding in a variety of our renal diseases, and uh, podocyte injury is a hallmark. Um, it's really the most common cause of uh, idiopathic nephrotic syndrome in the U.S. and the most common primary glomerular disease underlying ESRD in the USA. It is increasing in incidence for unclear reasons. And uh, there's evidence that supports a central role for a glomerular permeability factor in the pathogenesis of FSGS. Uh, APOL1 mutations are highly associated uh, with FSGS. And uh, the goal um, for us in treating the disease is really to offer a targeted therapy uh, for podocyte dysfunction. And um, you know, I'd just like to point out that uh, over time, you know, we've been, nephrology uh, sort of has been lagging behind uh, a lot of uh, other uh, specialties in medicine, a number of uh, clinical trials. Um, you can see, you know, oncology and Alzheimer's research um, uh, disorders of the GI tract have been um, sort of outpacing us, but the hope is that with these new discoveries, um, we can um, certainly improve uh, on the number of RCTs to offer better therapy for our patients. And, uh, and I think if you're going to invest in a stock, you'd want to find one with better potential, right? So I think it's better to be here uh, than to, it's, this can only go down, right? So it's pretty good. So not to, yeah, if anyone. But uh, I think that the future is bright, and, and we've, we've really benefited tremendously from a lot of the discoveries that have been made in the last uh, decade or so. So, um, you know, Alonzo went back. Uh, he was lucky, though, right? He's one of the lucky patients who actually went back and won an NBA championship uh, uh, after getting his kidney transplant. Uh, but, you know, a lot of our patients don't do as well, and we, we really owe it to them uh, to, to do better. Um, we actually have this international podocyte conference, a pretty geeky meeting, right, uh, by, by the, the title of it. But what, what, I, what, I will say, what I will say is Alonzo came, actually, in 2012. He came and, uh, you know, he got a standing ovation. Of course, everybody was drooling, right? But in any case, um, uh, it sort of gives inspiration to some of the work that we do. So happy to take some questions. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thanks for a nice presentation, and I, I don't know if you have enough influence with Alonzo, but is there any chance of people like him being moved to the Knicks or to the Brooklyn team? I know, that would be nice. I mean, the Knicks, I, I don't know about Brooklyn, I, not, not a fan of but, but the Knicks, that would be great. Well, I have the microphone, a more serious question about aging. So, right. Uh, it seems to me this disease occurs uh, much more often in young people. If that's correct, do you or your colleagues uh, study the, the role of normal aging and why would this disease occur more often in young people? That, that's an excellent question. And um, I don't know if I'd agree that it occurs more often in young people. It may be more aggressive. So the more aggressive phenotype and certainly more aggressive therapy that we like to offer would be in the young. But with aging, you do lose podocytes. And one of the earliest slides I showed uh, was that you, you do get proteinuria uh, you do get loss of podocytes as a part of the aging process. Um, and you know, if we were to biopsy you know, more elderly patients, we, we may see the lesion. Now, what does that mean? Um, we don't do it because we're likely not going to you know, bombard with nonspecific therapy. Um, but, but over time, that, that could be something uh, to be considered. But I think that the younger patients who, uh, t who develop uh, the nephrotic syndrome tend to have a worse prognosis, which is why a lot of the attention has been paid uh, toward that, that particular demographic group. To, to the uh, residents and med students in the audience, I just want to point out what an incredible uh, role model Kirk is. He's followed this story through since his fellowship um, and has persisted and is a real, really great role model as a clinician scientist and now is nationally known for the work that he's doing, is identifying novel targets and novel uh, um, a, a, a genes involved in etiology of this disease. So I want to commend him for his persistence and congratulate him on his success. So, well done, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.